Howdy folks, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles. Hope you all had a good weekend. Now forget it because it's Monday. I had a good weekend. Didn't go according to plan. I was supposed to be going to the Battle of Britain Air Show at the Imperial War Museum at Duxford on Saturday. But as is fairly typical by now, whenever I'm travelling anywhere, everything that possibly could go wrong went wrong. And seriously, most of it wasn't my fault. But, well, I'll cut a very long story short. We didn't end up going to the Battle of Britain Air Show. Instead, we spent the weekend at home. It was a good weekend, though. And yes, in case you're wondering, this is War Thunder. And yes, that is a T-64. Now, I don't own a T-64 myself. Um, I am able to start researching it, but it's a lot of experience to unlock and it's a lot of credits to purchase it. But I am at least able to take one for a test drive. And holy shit. I mean... <laughs> This tank, I, I am fully aware, of course, um, that, you know, nothing's shooting back at you when you're taking a tank for a test drive, but wow. Um, that's, that's all I can really say. Just wow. Stunning mobility. And this is the arcade model. Uh, if you're playing a realistic simulation, you're not going to be tearing around the map quite as quickly as this. But still, I mean, this tank is unbelievable. Um... I do have already. People have been submitting T64 and MBT70 and BMP1 uh, replays. So there is going to be some War Thunder videos coming up of the new vehicles, the new Tier 6 vehicles, which were introduced into War Thunder in the latest big patch last week. They will be coming up at some point during the course of this week. One T64 game in particular, and a BMP game as well. Screaming around the map and getting 8 kills in realistic battle in a T-64, I mean, I'm not saying it's easy. It isn't. You know, you still have to know what you're doing and make the most of the tank. But it's not going to be that surprising to see people getting, for example, 8 kills in realistic or simulator battle in a T-64, because it is a very, very good tank. But doing the same thing in a BMP-1? <laughs> it's an armored personnel carrier. It's not a tank. It was never supposed to fight tanks. Its job was to transport troops to the battlefield. And yet I've seen people doing exceptionally well in the BMP-1. Getting the kind of scores that you'd be proud of if you were in a T-64 or an MBT-70. Or a Mark 10 Chieftain with the Stillbrew armour package. All of which are now available for play in War Thunder. So you can expect to see some War Thunder content this week. I have to admit I was a little concerned at just what kind of impact tanks like the Mark 10 Chieftain, the MBT-70 and the T-64 are going to have on high tier gameplay in War Thunder. Because if you're playing a Mark 10 Chieftain right, you've got it hold down on a ridge line where you're basically impenetrable and you're just carving up Russian medium tanks. But well I really needn't have worried because here's the thing about online gaming, not everybody does it right. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of people do it very, very wrong. Just because you can unlock a Mark 10 Chieftain or an MBT-70 or a T-64 doesn't mean you know how to play it. And even if you are doing it right, you've got your Chieftain hull down on a ridgeline, uh, ready to carve up Russian medium tanks as they come charging across the central European plain. If there are no enemy tanks to shoot at, you're not doing anybody an awful lot of good in the perfect hull down position. Enemy players have this really annoying habit of not attacking you when you're at your strongest. Instead, they go elsewhere and find something easier to shoot at, leaving you very lonesome in your perfect hold-down position. So, a lot of the time, you just have to take the chance. Get out there and go looking for enemies to shoot at. And, well, you know what the side armor's like on a Chieftain, and an MBT-70, and a T-64. So these machines are far from unkillable, and in practice, it seems to be working out all right. It is of course still early days for tier 6 vehicles with composite armour and smoothbore guns in War Thunder, so time, as always, will tell. Meanwhile, in World of Warships, there's also been another patch. Now, I completely missed this happening. It wasn't until I went to log into the game and realised that I had to go through a download that I realised, oh yeah, that's right, there was a patch on the test server. I can remember talking about it in an episode of Mingles with Jingles, and I seem to remember saying I'm going to have to get onto the test server and have a look and see what this new naval base feature is all about, and then completely forgot to do it. So, like many of you, my first exposure to this new clan naval base facility feature was when I actually downloaded the patch on the live server. Nevertheless, I can remember in an episode of Mingles with Jingles a couple of weeks ago making confident predictions 
that anybody would be able to enjoy this new feature. You didn't have to be in a big clan. Even Billy No Mates could form a clan, even if you have no friends, just form a clan by yourself. Because the oil resource that you have to earn in order to develop the naval base facilities was gained primarily by opening your reward containers. And it doesn't take an awful lot to earn all three of your daily reward containers in World of Warships. And not only that, as well as the three containers per day that you can accumulate just by playing the game, there are also containers that can be awarded to you as a result of completing campaign missions. So all sorts of opportunities for getting these containers, and every container gives you 10 oil. So bare minimum, providing you're doing at least the three daily reward containers of 30 oil per day. Now, while it is certainly technically possible for you to unlock and build these base facilities just doing it by yourself, earning 30 oil per day, well, let's just say you're going to need the patience of a saint, <laughs> because that's what I found out the hard way. Um, some of these facilities are very, very expensive. Some of them for example, require 5,000 oil to unlock and construct. So unless you're in a very big clan, and by the way, I believe initially at least, the clan size is limited to 30 players, although this is something that you can expand with oil, you're either gonna need to be in a maximum sized clan or be in a medium sized clan with your friends who play the game a lot. You're not going to be doing it by yourself anytime soon. So that was a little disappointing, but realistically, I suppose it's only really to be expected because, well, you don't want people developing all of the base facilities in the course of a week <laughs> and then sitting around on thousands and thousands of oil with nothing to spend it on. Other games have introduced similar features. I remember when um, World of Warcraft, for example, they introduced a, a clan ranking system or a clan experience system where your clan could actually level up. And as you leveled up, and you did this basically just by playing the game, as long as members of the clan were running dungeons and playing battlegrounds and taking part in raids, then the clan earned experience. And as the clan ranked up, new buffs and features became available for clan members. And of course the big clans had unlocked just about everything in the space of a month, and then it was like, right, what now? Armoured Warfare had a similar issue. Back when Armoured Warfare was new, they had a base system, in exactly the same way as the naval base system that's just been introduced into World of Warships. You'd log in every day, collect your resources, and then spend the resources on developing your base, and it would give you all kinds of useful bonuses in exactly the same way that they're doing it in World of Warships. Um, it would reduce the maintenance cost for your tanks after battle, it would give you a bonus to experience, all sorts of good things just by developing these various different base facilities but then they kind of didn't really do anything with it. This was one of the things that Obsidian wanted to do with Armored Warfare, to make it a bit different from all of the other, you know, multiplayer online battle arena games out there. And of course their publisher didn't like it, so they stopped expanding upon the base facilities, and it really didn't take very long at all for everybody to fully develop their base and then sit there stockpiling massive amounts of base resources with absolutely nothing to spend it on. So it's not really surprising that you're in it for the long haul in World of Warships if you're going to be building up your base facilities. It's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, and it's certainly not something that you're going to be doing by yourself, not if you plan on getting it done any time this millennium. It's very definitely a group activity only. So, anyway, didn't get to go to the Imperial War Museum at Duxford, didn't get to see the Battle of Britain Air Show. Instead, on the bright side, I was able to catch... Um, I'm not entirely sure what you'd call it. As you're probably aware, I'm part of a YouTube partner network They're called Broadband TV. Uh, and these are the guys that basically manage my content for me. They'd organised, they called it a marketplace, which is a very, very posh way of saying it was a, a YouTube live stream with um, one of the YouTube content managers. And it was a sort of best practice for your YouTube channel. Focused mostly, I have to be honest here, on live streaming on YouTube, which is obviously, you know, a thing now. YouTube have just introduced ultra-low latency live streaming, where instead of the usual 30-second delay that you see on Twitch, for example, um, you're looking at a delay of one or two seconds, you know, providing your bandwidth can support it. So that's nice. But one of the things that took me completely by surprise 
was that they've introduced this thing that they're calling sponsorships. Now, again, it's focused mostly on live streaming. And what a sponsorship is on YouTube is basically it's just like a Twitch subscription. They obviously can't call it a subscription because YouTube already has subscriptions. It just doesn't cost you anything. You subscribe to a channel, like mine for example, and you get notifications when a new video goes up. But what they're doing now with these new YouTube sponsorships, it's sort of like the next step up from a subscription. Um, in exactly the same way that when you sub to a channel on Twitch, you pay your five dollars a month and you get all kinds of perks and benefits for being a subscriber to that Twitch channel. It's exactly the same on YouTube, except they call it a sponsorship. Again, this is primarily focused towards people who are going to be live streaming on YouTube. Google are very, very keen to promote live streaming on YouTube. They see themselves as a big competitor to Twitch. And they do offer things that Twitch doesn't, like ultra-low latency streaming. But you can sponsor any YouTube channel. It doesn't have to be one that utilises YouTube as a platform for streaming. Like me, for example, because I didn't buy myself an XSplit licence and get myself a Twitch partnership for nothing, thank you very much. I'm going to continue to stream on Twitch. And it was while I was streaming on Twitch on Saturday night after not going to the Battle of Britain Air show that I got my first YouTube sponsorship. Thank you very much to MoonEyes2K, who went to my YouTube gaming channel, found the sponsorship button and clicked it. And the timing is actually quite fortuitous because I have noticed in the comments of some of my videos lately, people have been asking, Jingles, have you got a Patreon page set up so we can, you know, support you directly as a thank you for putting the videos up every day? And I do actually have a Patreon page, but I've never published it and I've never advertised it. So, well, you know, unsurprisingly, I have zero patrons and never earn a penny from it. But this YouTube sponsorship thing is part and parcel of YouTube. And I know a bunch of you have been asking, and I don't have to go to any trouble to set this up in the same way that I do with a Patreon sponsorship. So, for all those of you who have been asking whether or not I can have something set up so that you can support me more directly, thank you very much indeed. Here's how you do it. First, you're going to have to find my YouTube gaming page. Most of you have probably had no idea that this even existed. <laughs> I have to admit, I discovered it once, um, uploaded a couple of personalizations, and then completely forgot about it, but it does exist. Um, and this is what it looks like. And there's the sponsorship button right there. So that's how you do it, if you care. If not, no problem whatsoever. Nobody is required to hit that sponsorship button. It's just there for those of you who've been bugging me about it. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm very, very grateful to anybody who does take advantage of the YouTube sponsorship. But it's absolutely, definitely not required. All that I require is that you continue to enjoy the videos that I put up every day. On the other hand, if you do wish to sponsor my YouTube channel, thank you very much. Here's how you do it, and there's a link down in the video description to the Mighty Jingles on YouTube Gaming, where the sponsor button is located. Fairly typically of Google, of course, the sponsorship button is not available, and I don't believe it's ever going to be available on my YouTube page, only on my YouTube gaming page. <laughs> so, <laughs> yay, Google. That's just the way they do things. How many of you have actually seen YouTube Gaming, by the way? I, actually, that's a good question. How many of you watch my videos from my YouTube page, and how many of you watch my videos from my YouTube gaming page? Because the YouTube gaming page is something that I very, very, very infrequently actually look at. In fact, I looked at it for the first time in about six months as a result of this whole YouTube sponsorship thing. Because you can get to YouTube gaming from any of my videos, providing that, you know, the game is big enough to have its own YouTube gaming channel. For example, if you look at any of my World of Tanks videos, if you look down in the video description, you will see that YouTube's algorithm recognises that it's a World of Tanks video, and so it provides a World of Tanks badge and a link to further World of Tanks videos on YouTube gaming. Which means that if you click that button, you'll see nothing but World of Tanks videos from, you know, everybody. And it's the same for World of Warships, Ghost Recon. Um, I don't know if Cold Waters has a YouTube gaming channel yet. It's easy enough to find out. I just go to a Cold Waters video and see whether or not this badge appears in the video description. But if all you're interested in is World of Tanks, then it's not a bad idea, actually, this whole YouTube gaming concept, because World of Tanks, YouTube gaming, nothing but World of Tanks videos. World of Warships, nothing but World of Warships videos. Um, you can see reviews, let's plays, what's popular, stuff that it's recommended for you, and so on and so on and so on. It's not a bad way of actually getting your daily video. The good thing about YouTube gaming 
particularly you know if you're a gamer because as the title suggests it's all about gaming so if for example you wanted to get some tiger replays from world of tanks and you just typed into the youtube search box tiger tank you'd probably get a fair number of world of tanks tiger replays you'd probably get some war thunder ones as well but you'd also get a whole bunch of stuff that just wasn't actually gaming related whatsoever if you were to do the exact same thing in the youtube gaming search box however all you'll get are gaming related videos so it, it is it's definitely very good for that sort of thing if gaming is specifically what you're interested in so that's youtube gaming it's been around for ages but you know as <laughs> as is fairly typical of me i've completely failed to notice it until now oh well it's been a fairly quiet week really i mean okay there was a patch in world of warships we've got naval bases and some other stuff war thunder obviously huge news uh, the first tier 6 vehicles available in game machines like the t64 the mark 10 chieftain yada 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 and so on and so on world of tanks well there's a new test server up but it's not a huge patch i mean there's they're, they're reworking the personal missions and i don't know some other stuff more vehicle rebalances let's take a look let's see what's getting rebalanced this time around because i remember in the first round of vehicle rebalances they decided the t-54's turret armor wasn't strong enough <laughs> and it needed a buff yes really so let's take a look i'm actually on the web page right now you can probably hear the mouse clicking and let's see what new rebalances are coming in <laughs> um so here we go large scale update to the long awaited backup campaign okay fine uh orders changes to the mission following missions underwent changes well it's about time some of these personal missions for the stug 4 and the t55a and the t28 htc were all but undoable so I mean, there's just it looks like they're completely reworking just about every single mission available so that's good and i dare say that the light tank rebalance has probably had something to do with that improvements to boot camp reworked a number of vehicles to hd quality 15 in total so that's good uh changes to vehicles here we go oh yes i knew there was something i had to talk about yes of course changes to the tech tree the fv215b is to be replaced with the super conqueror the super conqueror right I briefly mentioned this in last week's Mingles with Jingles. I said, once again, they're just making shit up. And everybody jumped on me and said, no, Jingles, the Super Conqueror existed. We've seen photographs of it. No, you haven't. <laughs> right. <laughs> we need to make this absolutely clear. Well, technically you have. But the photographs that you've seen were not of a Super Conqueror. The whole basis for this new turret on the Conqueror is as a result of a drawing that was found in the National Archives. Just a drawing. It wasn't even a technical plan, okay? It was just a drawing. Now, on the basis of this drawing, they mocked up some spaced armour, stuck it around the turret of a Conqueror, and set it on a firing range. This was not technically a tank. It was certainly never intended to fight anything. This was a range target. What was being tested here wasn't the spaced armour on the turret. It was the guns that were firing at it. In fact, it wasn't just guns that were being fired at it. This so-called Super Conqueror, aka the new Tier 10 range target, <laughs> was, <laughs> was used to test the L4 183mm gun, the Centurion's 105mm gun, and the Malkara missile armed with a Hesh warhead. The results were spectacular, to say the least. The Malkara missile cracked the mantlet of the Conqueror wide open and split the hull in two. The L4 183mm gun round caused severe spalling inside the turret. And when I say severe spalling, they counted 3,800 separate bits that <laughs> got knocked off the inside of the turret and went flying around the interior of the fighting compartment. At the same time, just for giggles, they decided to test the 183mm gun firing Hesh at a Centurion that was parked up next to the Super Conqueror range target. The first shot from this gun uh, clean blew off the middle three road wheels and the second shot knocked the turret right off the tank how do you know all this jingles well i've actually seen the photographs now i'm not allowed to share them with you because they're not for public viewing but while we appreciate that super conqueror sounds a lot better than range target as the name for the new tier 10 british heavy tank 
range target is in fact what it was. It was a surplus to requirements conqueror with spaced armour placed around the turret used to evaluate the effect of a Malkara missile, the L7 120mm gun and the L4 183mm gun and it failed spectacularly. The results were not pretty. While we're in rumour control, some more news for you regarding upcoming British vehicles in World of Tanks. A little birdie tells me that we're probably going to see a brand new British high tier tank destroyer, possibly tier 10. It's known as the FV217, Fighting Vehicle 217, and it's basically it's a, it's a tank destroyer based on the chassis of the Conqueror. Now it was going to be given the same calibre gun as the Conqueror, 120mm, but a more powerful version of it. Now this thing may never make it into the game, I mean they've had the Chieftain model in the game for well over a year and we still have no sign of the Chieftain in World of Tanks. But I have been informed that a model of this game does, ex uh, this game, sorry, of this machine, the FV217, does actually exist in the game files. What we don't have at the moment for this thing is a proper name. At the moment it's just known by the project designation, the FV217. Now, when it comes to choosing a name for this thing, of the names that were available for projects that never made it past the mock-up stage, only two are available. So what we do know about this FV217 is that if it ever does make it in a world of tanks, it's either going to be called the Castle or, wait for it, the Badger. <laughs> Doesn't exactly instill fear, does it? Well, then again, neither does Tortoise. And nobody really complains about that, so yeah, well, anyway, so yes, you heard it here first, you know, unless you heard it somewhere else, in which case you heard it here second, FV217, Conqueror-based 120mm gun-armed British tank destroyer, probably tier 10, appearing, well, who knows, <laughs> maybe soon, maybe never. Anyway, time for a war story, they're always popular. Oh, actually, last week's war story got me in the shit, did you know that? Apa Last week's Mingles with Jingles got demonetized by YouTube. That's Google for you. Apparently, talking about history isn't advertiser friendly. I think what had actually happened, uh, because I appealed it straight away, and the video has since, you know, it's had its monetization status restored, because I talked about a German war hero. And more specifically, because while talking about a German war hero, and he was a war hero, Hans Joachim Marseille, I had a couple of people emailing me saying, how can you talk about a German war hero? The Germans were all bastards. No, they weren't. A lot of them were. A lot of them were complete Nazi bastards, but Hans Joachim Marseille was definitely not. But in that episode of Mingles with Jingles, I featured a couple of pictures of Hans Joachim Marseille, and one of them featured the man himself standing at the tailplane of his BF-109, uh, with all the kill markings displayed on the tailplane, but also, because it was a Luftwaffe fighter aircraft of World War II, there was a swastika on the tailplane. And I'm pretty sure that YouTube's automated algorithms have analysed that video, realised that there was a swastika, and immediately demonetized it. Well, I appealed it, and it's been restored, but seriously, I mean, what are we all afraid of? It's just an image. And it's historical. I just... I despair sometimes, I really do. Well, anyway, related to last week's story of Hans Joachim Marseille, you'll be aware that he was never shot down. He achieved 156 kills. And they weren't farming kills against, you know, noobs on the Eastern Front, badly trained Russian pilots with obsolete aircraft. He was fighting against the Royal Air Force, flying against Spitfires. Um, 155 of his 156 kills were fighter aircraft. His, his single non-fighter kill was against a twin-engined Maryland. Other than that, everything he shot down was a well-trained Royal Air Force pilot flying an aircraft that was at least as good as his. However, he traded in his BF-109F for a new model BF-109G, and this is what killed him. It developed engine problems, and smoke began to fill the cockpit. Um, he returned to base, I talked all about this in last week's episode of Mingles with Jingles, uh, became overcome by the fumes that were filling the cockpit, tried to bail out, got knocked unconscious or possibly killed by the tailplane of the BF-109G, and fell to the ground to his death. Well, it turns out that this was not an uncommon occurrence in the BF-109G, which was the latest heaviest and most powerful variant 
of the BF109. It was certainly considered to be superior to any models of Spitfire that were currently in service at the time that the BF109G, the Gustav, was introduced. But it did have an alarming habit of catching fire. Shortly after Hans Joachim Marseille was killed, when his BF109G had its engine burst into flames and fill his cockpit with smoke. Shortly after Marseille's death, another Luftwaffe pilot by the name of Heinz Nocker was sitting at Alert 5 on his airstrip waiting for orders when a Royal Air Force Mosquito was reported in the vicinity of Oldenburg. Nocker, along with his wingman, both flying BF109Gs, were ordered to intercept. While climbing to attack altitude, Nocker noticed that his wingman was falling behind. By the time they'd reached 12,000 feet, he'd lost sight of him completely. He called him on the radio, but got no reply. It was then that he noticed the flaming wreckage of an aircraft on the ground below. Was this Venikas, his wingman, he wondered. Now, Noka never caught up with a mosquito, and so, descending in a handful of spirals, he headed back to his airbase, and on landing, however, much to his surprise and relief, was Feldwebel Venikas, laughing at his shocked expression. Venikas then explained that his BF-109G had suddenly caught fire mid-air for no apparent reason, in exactly the same way as the plane Marseille had been flying. Apparently, another Gustav in a nearby squadron had also caught fire in exactly the same way. This was not an uncommon occurrence with the BF-109G, the Luftwaffe's latest and greatest fighter aircraft in 1942. You see, the thing is, in 1940, the BF-109E was... You could make a fair claim to say that the BF-109E was the finest single-engine fighter aircraft in the world. It could do three things that a modern fighter needed to do better than any other. It could climb fast, it could dive fast, and it had 55 seconds worth of ammunition with its combination of cannons and machine guns. So it had better firepower than any other operational single-engine fighter at the time. But it was still a 1930s design. Now, it was a very, very good 1930s design, way ahead of its time. And there was room for improvement, but there was a limit to how much improvement you could actually coax out of a 1930s airframe. They certainly tried. They improved the aerodynamics. They moved the weapons from the wings to the central fuselage. They gave it a bigger engine, the Daimler Benz 605. But while the Daimler Benz 605 was a more powerful engine, it produced nearly 200 horsepower more than the engine that had been fitted to previous versions of the BF109, it did so at a price. 250 kilos more weight, which meant that the BF109 was a more powerful aircraft, but it was also heavier and it had lost a lot of its agility. And the Daimler Benz 605 engine, while it could take the BF-109 up to altitudes of 40,000 feet, it didn't do very well at low speeds. And then there were all those engine fires that kept breaking out. You see, the problem with the BF-109G, and it's symptomatic of the German war machine as a whole in World War II, was that they were trying to build ever more powerful, capable, and complicated and expensive machines with which to win the war but they didn't have the resources to fight a long war. Germany's entire war effort was predicated on a swift victory, and they had the chance of winning that swift victory in 1940 in the Battle of France, but they failed to knock out Britain. The German High Command was very continentalist in their attitude. They never fully appreciated just how dangerous Britain would prove to be, and so they never devoted the resources, steel in particular, to building U-boats that could have knocked Britain out of the war by 1941 if they'd bothered listening to Admiral Dönitz. The overwhelming majority of the Kriegsmarine's steel allocation, rather than being devoted to U-boat construction, which could have won them the war, instead was devoted to constructing vanity projects, battleships like the Bismarck and the Tirpitz, which certainly looked impressive on a newsreel, and definitely gave the British Home Fleet their fair share of headaches, but from an operational and strategic perspective, were just a complete waste of resources. Resources that Germany just didn't have. Germany is actually a very resource-poor country, at least when we're talking about the kind of resources that are essential for fighting a long war. The only thing that Germany had in any kind of numbers was coal. Now, you need coal to make steel, but Germany doesn't have enough iron ore, and had to import most of it from Sweden. Under ideal circumstances, Germany would have been able to devote all of its coal resources towards the manufacture of steel for its panzers and its U-boats and its battleships and so on and so on and so on. But unfortunately, Germany also lacked another vital resource. Germany didn't have any oil of its own. Now, Britain didn't have any oil of its own either, but Britain had a global empire. 
and could import all of the oil that it needed, Germany didn't have this luxury. So instead Germany had to invest heavily in the production of synthetic oil. Now there's one thing that you need to know about manufacturing synthetic oil. It uses a lot of coal. And if you're using coal to produce synthetic oil, which you absolutely definitely have to have if you want to fight a war, you can't use that coal to manufacture steel. So while Germany had enough coal to support their steel building industry or their synthetic oil manufacturing industry, they didn't have enough coal for both. And they ended up needing to import coal as well, which was ironic because it's the only natural resource vital for fighting a modern war that Germany had in any kind of numbers anyway. And the other thing that you need to know about synthetic oil is that it is shit. <laughs> it is a terrible lubricant compared to natural oil. The shift to roller bearings from ball bearings in the Daimler-Benz 605 engine for the BF109G meant that the increased friction, which wouldn't have been a problem if Germany had had decent oil, meant that the synthetic oil which was lubricating the engine was bursting into flames because it was terrible stuff. But it's all Germany had. At no point during World War II did Germany ever have the resources to win a war that was going to last longer than a few months. They had their chance to win it in 1940 and they blew it when they failed to knock Britain out of the equation. They were then forced, if they wanted to win, rather than sue for peace, to open up a second front against Russia because they needed those oil fields in the east. And when that failed to happen in 1941, they were doomed. Hitler made matters even worse for himself at that point by declaring war on America in a show of solidarity with Japan, his Axis partner. Biggest mistake you could ever make beyond invading Russia. It may have seemed like a safe bet at the time, but well, in 1940 the US Army was outnumbered by the Cub Scouts of America. <laughs> no joke. Um, but Roosevelt had been preparing. He knew that war was coming and he wanted to ensure that America was ready. I could go into great detail about how America prepared economically for World War II. It was nothing short of a miracle of organisation. But just as one example of how you really shouldn't mess around with America in a war of resources. Have you ever heard of Liberty Ships? If you play World of Warships there are a number of operations where there are a bunch of Liberty Ships that either have to be sunk or have to be escorted. The Liberty Ship was basically a transport ship that was built in record time. There was a fellow called Henry Kaiser of German descent but an American citizen who constructed a number of shipyards in America on both the East and West Coast with the objective of turning these ships out in record time. One of Kaiser's dockyards managed to turn out an entire Liberty Ship in 10 days in 1942. This was unbelievable. But another one of his shipyards saw this as a challenge. And so they produced the Liberty Ship working around the clock. It was called the Robert E. Peary. And it was launched into the sea within four days, 15 hours and 26 minutes of construction beginning. Seriously, Germany, how were you ever going to compete with this? The U-boats just could not sink them fast enough. Just as another example of how woefully underprepared Germany was for fighting a long war, let's take a look at the major source of protein that the German people ate. Pork. Germany at the beginning of World War II had 24 million pigs and about 4 million sheep. Britain, by contrast, the numbers were almost exactly reversed. They had about 24 million sheep and about 4 million pigs. So the Germans ate a lot of sausage. But here's the thing, what do sheep eat? They eat grass. Nobody cares. <laughs> Britain's covered in the stuff. Nobody else is using it. What do pigs eat? Pigs eat things that Germans could have been eating if they weren't being used to feed the pigs that the Germans were eating. Germany was wasting its food resources to produce food resources. It was a comical situation. There was just no way Germany or any of its Axis partners, because Japan was in an even worse situation, and Italy didn't have any natural resources other than cheese and wine. <laughs> 
because the war wasn't over in 1940 from that point on it was unwinnable and when they opened the second front in 1941 and failed to win that Germany doomed themselves at that point it was just a question of how long it was going to take for them to lose the end result was never in any doubt anyway that's it for this week's episode with mingles of with mingles i've forgotten how to speak english for a second there sorry about that <laughs> that's it for this week's episode of mingles with jingles i hope you've enjoyed it uh, i hope you have a great week and i'll see you tomorrow with uh, tomorrow's video i'm not sure quite what it is going to be yet but i'm sure I'll, I'll come up with something in the meantime take care and i'll catch you next time